Okay, thank you for inviting me here today. Uh, I'm sorry I couldn't make it, it's a, it's a long way to travel. Uh, so, hello to everyone from Western Australia. Um, that's where Perth is. Uh, this is a picture of Western Australia taken by Commander Hadfield from the International Space Station. And I live just, just north of Perth, in one of the suburbs of Perth. Um, and the rest of you are about 14,000 kilometres uh, northeast. Uh, northwest, and I don't really need to tell you where Western Australia is because uh, the Dutch were here in 1606. But for the rest of you Europeans, um, we're a long way down south. Uh, so I'm here to talk today about OSCube One. Uh, it's a project that I started a while ago. Um, a quick summary: it's a one-unit pocket cube. It was designed and built by myself here in Australia, and the objectives are to successfully operate in space, which is kind of a prerequisite for uh, most things, um, but it's going to capture colour images of Australia from space um, and it's going to transmit those images to people on the ground. So uh, it'll transmit them around the world so people from Australia can receive them and, and amateur radio people all around the world can receive those images. Um, so as I said, I've been working on it for a while. Uh, it started back in 2014 and it wasn't long after the first batch of pocket cubes were launched. Um, and they were a big inspiration actually for, for starting a project of my own, uh, especially $50 sat. It um, wasn't just the, the cost because I thought, you know, it's pretty good and I could cope with a, a build cost of $50. Um, but they, because they published the information about how, you know, how they built their satellite and, and the, you know, some of the process and the, the performance and you could sort of see everything from the build side and, and then see it operating in space and because it was so successful in space uh, it was a big inspiration to me but it turns out that satellites do actually cost more than $50 to build so um, I didn't let that put me off uh, I continued uh, on my project and um, you'll see where I am but I guess one, one question that people often say is how do you start building a satellite um, it's not something you sort of generally talk about in, in, in the bar um, and you know most people it's, it's a strange hobby when you when you tell them what you're doing so um, you know myself I started I, I didn't have any experience building satellites um, I don't live in a country that actually has a space program um, as much as we're fighting for it the, the politicians haven't uh, got on board yet um, you're in the most isolated capital city in the world uh, Perth is really a long way from everywhere. Um, when I started the project I hadn't even created a custom circuit board before. Um, so one of the one of the reasons I undertook the project was to, to teach myself all, all these sort of new skills that, that, I, that I found interesting. Um, but I don't have funding, this is a personal a hobby project so it's something that I do in my own time and, and spend my own money doing. So, um, And I don't really have any specialist tools. Um, so, how do you start building a satellite? Uh, I guess the, the answer was use the internet. Uh, it, it's, it's a great resource, there's, there's so much information uh, that's, that's available to you, uh, if, as long as you know how to filter out the, the good from the bad, um, and start small. And, and pocket cubes are, are small, they're affordable, um, and that's, that's a great place to start. So as I was going through the process of, of designing and, and building OSCUBE on, I set some high level requirements. Um, because I wanted to learn, I was going to design and build these electronics myself. Um, but it also meant that nothing could be too advanced. I couldn't uh, have any really small, small pitch parts. Um, I was using surface mount, I wasn't going through whole components, but um, it was still sort of two layer circuit boards. Um, it was going to be built in the PQ60 form factor. And I'm sure most of you uh, are familiar with what PQ60 is. It's the sort of a, a what we call a community developed standard for uh, the internal electrical and mechanical components of a, of a pocket cube. And I think there's a bit more discussion about standards and that later on today. Um, but I wanted it in that form factor just so that the, the parts that I made are going to be compatible with uh, things that other people are making down the track. Um, and it had to be affordable. Um, couldn't spend a you know a huge amount of money on it, uh, especially in one go. So the aim was actually to keep the the, the raw cost of the materials below a thousand dollars. But 
Mm-hmm. I guess as, as you find out um, along the way, I've probably spent a lot more than that uh, on, on parts over the years. Um, but the actual, you know, the bomb cost of the, of the hardware, I'm, I think I'm on track to, to keep it at that point. And so I started with the solar panels. Um, and I guess the question is why? Well, they were, they were simple to make. Uh, I needed something to be able to test the rest of the, the system with, and so solar panels uh, seem to be a good starting point. You know, start from the outside and work in. Um, but which which solar panels to use? Which solar cells? Um, the task cells, um, the the triangular cells that were from Spectralab, they were the, the common cells used on on um, CubeSats. Uh, but I sent off an email inquiry and didn't really hear back from them, didn't really know where else to, to find them. Um, you know, once again, don't have any contacts here in Australia. Um, and so I sort of, that fell upon deaf ears. So I thought, what else? What else can I find? And so I used the internet, did a bit more Googling, and I found some really cool 2 by 2 centimeter little tiny, little tiny little cells from Japan. So I emailed them, got a quote, and almost 20,000 US dollars for 30 cells. That was, uh, yeah, about $650 for a single cell. So that was um, pretty much out of, out of my budget. So I had to had to keep looking for something else. Uh, one of the things when I've been building OzCube 1 was, was looking at what other people have done, what you know missions have, have flown and, and what was successful in, in their missions. So I thought, well, even though Ren wasn't entirely successful, um, you know, Renwin was a, a pocket cube that was that was built and assembled and sent to space. So, so what did they use? So I thought I'll, I'll have a look at the integration video and you know, get some get some close ups of of what they used, and found these little tiny little black things. And I thought, oh, what are they? So a bit bit more googling and you know, image searching that kind of thing. Ixus, everyone's everyone's heard of Ixus, haven't they? Um, so I looked and found that you could get them from DigiKey. Um, but they're not space grade, but they've got a laminate over the silicon that uh, you need to test for outgassing and a bunch of other things. Uh, Ren's one, as it turns out, had a hard epoxy coating and they, they revised them uh, between when Ren was made and when I started buying them. But for an engineering version, for a first circuit board, I thought that they'd do. Um, and that's the result there. That's sort of a pretty pretty basic solar panel. Um, you know, mounting holes, solar cells, not much room for really anything else. Um, but that's going to put out about you know, 223 milliwatts here on the ground. Uh, obviously a, bit, a little bit higher in space. Um, so it's not, not too bad. And really for a board that costs only about $30, I figured it was a, was a good start. Um, so I'd baseline the performance with those cells. Um, and what else was there? And these uh, rather odd shaped Trisol X cells appeared on the market. Um, they were sort of a replacement for the Spectralab the task cells. Um, they're twenty-eight percent efficient, so they, these are these are space grade cells. Um, and so I found that that you could get them sort of reasonably you know, fairly affordably. And so one of the problems with the with the odd shape was that you had to you know move them around to, to try and fit them in. Um, and so I ended up with a sort of a what I thought was a, an optimal pattern. Uh, learned how to reflow in a skillet, so um, I don't have a reflow oven, but I had a you know, little electric hot plate, so um, I assembled these these cells in there um, and made a panel that was about 272 milliwatts, and so that's uh, you know, 22% better than the Ixus panels. Um, you know, a little bit more expensive, so these are about $45. So I thought, you know, I'm on the right track for for solar cells. Um, and that's okay for the engineering version, but what about when it comes to the to the flight versions? Um, Trisol X have now trimmed off the top of the cells, so you waste a bit less less space, um, which is great for, I guess, improving the um, squeezing more in on, on the panel. And so, when I build the flight versions, uh, I'm going to use these these new trimmed cells. Um, another thing that I found as as I was developing it, you know, actually mounting panels. Uh, CubeSats have got like you know, big corners and you can just clip on your, your solar cells but um, pocket cubes you, you need to put, put screws in there and they take up space so um, I needed to sort of move the screws just in a little bit to make sure that they could all mount properly um, and these flatter cells sort of allowed me to do that so 
Um, I came up with a new design, um, and I'm not showing that here today, but I'll reveal that on the when I make the flight model. Um, so next on the, on the on the DIY is the the chassis and the structure. So when you're building a satellite, you can you can buy things off the shelf if, if there's some available, um, or you can try making your own. Um, and so I thought, well, I could buy some 50 millimeter square extruded aluminium tube from the local hardware shop. Uh, I bought some and, and tried some simple tests. Um, literally just you know drilled and tapped some holes and bolted together a few bits of aluminium just see how hard they were to, to pull out. And it turns out that um, a 1.5 millimeter thickness really isn't enough um, and the strength of the, the hardware grade really uh, really wasn't strong enough. And so I had to try and find something stronger. Um, so speaking to Tom from Alba Orbital, uh, their chassis are made from 6082 grade. And so I thought, well, maybe I could find some 6082 in UK. And it turns out, yes, uh, it's a grade that's relatively common over there. But you know, postage is expensive. There's a you know, six meter length. Um, but luckily, I know someone in the UK with machine tools, uh, Joe Hinchliffe. Uh, concrete dog. Uh, hi there. You'll, you're up next after the coffee break, so uh, get ready. Um, so I asked Joe to source the aluminium to, to make the chassis, um, and I guess we sort of agreed that, that uh, he would sort of buy the aluminium and, and sort of make the chassis for me. So he'd make it to my design, which meant I actually had to learn how to use CAD tools to, to, to show him a proper design. And so in the meantime, uh, I actually used a 3D printer to, to create a, a model of the chassis um, just so I could do sort of fit checks and things like that. So uh, these are the kind of sort of you know, tools and resources that, that you use. Um, and just talking about some of the little things about building a satellite. So uh, the PQ60 standard specified M2 for the holes in each circuit board, but um, do you think I could find them in Australia? No, once again, it wasn't something that, that anyone here stopped. Uh, I found an American company that had them, um, and look, you, you, you could do custom ones there, you could finish them in, in anodized uh, nickel plating, gold plating, you could do all sorts of uh, platings and coatings, um, but they had a pretty large sort of minimum order quantity in sort of the you know, thousands of dollars, so I thought, well, that's once again not, not a very good option. Um, but I ended up finding a, a Japanese company uh, called Hirosugi Keiki, um, sorry if I didn't pronounce that right. Um, but they had sort of minimum order quantities of, of 50, but th their pricing was really good, uh, and it turns out they're, they're, they're great quality. So uh, at the moment, I'm, I'm using them. Um, and brackets to, to hold things together uh, and to attach the end boards. Um, I've been prototyping with the 3D printer to make those little brackets, um, but because they're sort of really fiddly, um, I want to sort of get the design right before uh, Machinist Joe gets to gets to make them. So um, I've been making yeah, little brackets on the 3D printer. And so I just want to do a quick run through on what's in the rest of the satellite for you. Um, once again, it's, you know, this is a DIY thing. So these are, these are things that, that are sort of you know, entry level, well, kind of entry level things. So um, the Arduino is popular. Um, and myself being a big novice programmer, um, I went with the, the Atmel Atmega 328P processor for it. Um, but really I was just starting there and thinking, well, what else do I need to do um, in this satellite? You know, it, it's going to build on what $50 sat did, but uh, I wanted to have a, sort of a few features that, that were going to be useful. So um, for me, if I'm going to be taking photos of Australia, I need, I need a clock. I need to be out of time when I'm going to take these photos. Um, I need some sort of power management um, just to manage the you know the radiation environment. Um, a watchdog is useful once again for in case the um, processor gets hit by some high energy particles uh, just to remove the power and, and reset it. Um, storage, uh, micro SD card. Um, obviously I've got to store the, the photos somewhere so they're going to be stored on the micro SD card. Um, I've got a 9 axis IMU right in the, in the middle there. Um, Obviously, in space, half of those half of those readings aren't going to be any good, but um, the magnetometer is uh, possibly going to be useful uh, just for measuring sort of rotation rates and things like that. Um, but what I've found, even even through sort of some of the the, the coding that I've done so far, is that I, I may need more RAM, so I may need to actually upgrade to the to the next level processor um, that that still is compatible with Arduino, but it's just got more more RAM. 
uh, on the radio side of things. Uh, look, 50 dollars set demonstrated that you could you know, get telemetry with 100 milliwatt, little little tiny RFM 22B module um, that's based on the Silicon Labs SI4432. Um, but they're only pushing through just you know some some numbers, some basic telemetry. Um, I'm going to be pushing images through, so so I'm going to need some higher data rates. Uh, and so I found a, the, the the newer cousin for the SI4432, which is the SI4463, um, and found a little a module that, that actually has one watt of um, RF output, and that's uh, from Nice RF. And so I'm aiming to, to get these images down sort of at 19.2k, um, with 9.6k sort of the default mode, and a lot of other CubeSats sort of default to the you know, 2400 bits or 9600 bits, so um, I'm, I'm hoping that, that that should be achievable with the, with the one watt. Um, I was going to use RTTY like $50 sat, um, but I might not have enough RAM to sort of get that into the in the code base. So we'll see how we go. Um, obviously, I want to make it accessible to, to as many people as I can, um, but uh, it may just be a case of you have to use these radio modules to, to do the decoding. Um, it'll be using a custom packet format um, because these these chips can sort of you know, uh, form the the packets on board in, in, in hardware. So. Um, I'll publish that packet format before launch so that anyone can decode it. Uh, the power system, uh, it's a, it's a you know, completely custom design, um, but the big sort of feature is, is the, the thing that's missing, it's the, it's the hole in the middle. Um, it just it would seem to be a, a good way to be able to package the, the camera and all those features into the, into the one unit pocket cube. Um, and it wasn't just the camera, because the camera needs a, a decent sized lens as well, so um, that was going through uh, the EPS board. So it's got four channel MPPT trackers, um, it'll be one, one per panel and uh, one of them is going to be shared with the, the top panel and the bottom panel. Um, monitors the, the battery and the, the, the solar bus voltage. Um, the, the, there's current limiting switches on uh, the buses and, and the, the payload of the camera and uh, it, it manages the battery charging hopefully a lot better than $50 set so with any luck it, it might last a little bit longer. Um, the payload, the camera, uh, it's a 2 megapixel sensor, it's a little little, little tiny module, uh, it's based on a STM microcontroller. Um, the main thing is it, it, yeah, it's, not a, it's not a high high quality module, um, it, it only has sort of very limited limited functions um, but I've just upgraded it with with a you know, decent quality lens that, that should you know not degrade in space as much as, as the, the cheap ones. Um, a stronger stronger mount, uh, a cus well, it's a it's an anodized aluminium mount, but that's going to be a lot stronger and hopefully uh, not break apart. So that should give me the equivalent um, ground sample distance about 54 meters per pixel. So uh, yeah, not great, but it's sort of the the low res from from Landsat from a I think Landsat 7 or so, so it's, yeah, not too bad. Um, and so yeah, finally, um, I'm crowdfunding the launch, so uh, if anyone wants to donate, please donate. Um, and just to say to people, that, you know, things that might start as, as DIY or uni projects in the beginning can, can lead to bigger things. Um, I'm starting a, a starter business here in, here in Perth called Picasat Systems uh, with another fellow space fan, and we're going to look at commercialising some of the, the pocket cube system so uh, if you're interested there just just pop me an email um, otherwise yeah just follow the OSCE one project on Twitter and Facebook and if you need to read more about it uh, the STEM network have a have a profile on there um, and yeah any questions okay enjoy the rest of the conference